Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, tonight I bring you a very special stream, uh, The Middle East Crisis, uh, an overview of John Bagot Glubb's uh, The Middle East Crisis pamphlet he wrote in 1967 in the aftermath um, of the Six Day War. Um, based on the current goings on in the Middle East, I thought it was re relevant to go over the, uh, this pamphlet and a lot of his insights. So uh, before I go any further, I just want to um, read a excerpt from the book Prophets of Doom, just sort of giving a bit of an overview as to who Glubb was. So, so John Bagger Glubb, 1897 to 1986, best known as Glubb Pasha, led the Arab Legion in Transjordan from 1939 to 1956. Before that, he served as in the Royal Engineers in the First World War, during which he was injured three times, for which he was awarded a military cross. One of the injuries he suffered was a shattered jaw, which later, during his time among the Arabs, earned him the nickname The One with the Little Jaw. In 1920, he was transferred to Iraq and in the 1930s joined the Arab Legion. He became its commander in 1939. When Glubb took over, it was reputedly a ragtag of irregular troops. By the time of his dismissal by King Hussein in 1956, he had transformed them into a professional fighting force said to have been the best trained Arab army in the Middle East. As commander of the Arab Legion, he took part in the Second World War, chiefly in the 1941 Allied invasion of Iraq. He also led the Arab Legion in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War on the pro-Palestinian side. By all accounts, Glubb had developed a deep affection for and loyalty to the Arabs, to the extent that he took up their causes even after his time in the Middle East. For this he has, perhaps predictably, been criticised by various pro-Zionist writers. In 1951, Abdullah I of Jordan was assassinated, which led to a succession crisis. His eldest son, Talal, suffered from schizophrenia. His younger brother, Hussein, effectively ruled in his stead from the age of 16. During this time, Glubb personally became very powerful as a steadying hand in the kingdom and was said to have been even more powerful than the king. In 1956, King Hussein wanted to rid his army of British elements and Glubb was dismissed following a minor dispute. It is said that the age disparity between the two men contributed to the dismissal. The king, barely 20, Glubb nearly 60, and it must be remembered that Glubb was a very old-fashioned 60, paternal in his outlook, where the king was concerned. His manner was very much that of the older and more experienced man dealing with his junior. Despite this, Glubb was still very fondly remembered in Jordan and the Middle East more widely, both in general and specifically by King Hussein himself. After retiring, Glubb became a historian and writer and authored 17 books, chiefly devoted to Arab history, and this is where our interest lies, particularly in his 1978 article, later turned to a pamphlet, The Fate of Empires, 1978. So that should give you a nice little overview as to who Glubb was, and so a British military officer stationed in the Middle East um, throughout the um, 1930s, 40s and, and 50s. Uh, so uh, after his dismissal as the leader of the Arab Legion by King Hussein in 1956, he would go off into retirement and um, become a historian and a writer. So when he wrote The Middle East Crisis, um, he was sort of asked to give his take on what was happening. So... Uh, without further ado, I will begin reading. Uh, it's broken into three sections. So we have what he calls the role of Russia, part one, Asia and Africa, part two, and a brief history of the Palestine greed grievance, which is part three. After reading each of the parts, I will then um, give my own sort of interpretation and relate what Glub's saying to the present crisis that's going on. The Middle East crisis, a personal apologia. I'm an old man, unlikely much longer to grace this mortal scene. For ten years, I've tried to avoid violent controversy, seeking refuge in the calmer atmosphere of historical studies. I do not think that I have any remaining passions, hatreds, jealousies or ambitions. I do not wish to go to my maker with hate in my heart. I'd never dreamed that I would return to these bitter struggles. I've been persuaded to do so by the avalanche of letters which I have received, asking me to publish an unprejudiced unpreju summary. Like all of us, I too have my prejudices. I love the Jordanians. Why? Well, I suppose largely because they are lovable. Sympathy and affection cannot be based on profit and loss like a statement of accounts. They are simple people, warm-hearted, welcoming, brave, generous and hospitable. Ethnically, they are not in any way related to the Egyptians and everyone who knows them recognises that they have many distinctive features of their own. 
I also love America and have spent many happy months staying with innumerable friends in the United States. In the Middle East, however, their interests are not identical with our own. I do not, however, dislike anyone else, Syrians, Lebanese, Egyptians or Israelis. Many Jews do not like the aggressive military atmosphere of Israel and adhere to the old, generous, cultured, liberal Jewry. I have many Jewish friends also. I hope I shall not receive streams of abusive letters from all concerned. I have lost the habit for the last 10 years. All I should like to do before I die is to contribute something to the peace of the Middle East, where I've lived most of my life. Part 1. The Role of Russia The Russian Plan When large formations of the Egyptian army began to cross the Suez Canal in the middle of May 1967, the world was taken completely by surprise. Egypt then demanded the withdrawal of the United Nations forces and announced her intention to search all ships entering the Gulf of Aqaba. Russia became her support and notified Turkey of her intention to pass warships through the Bosphorus. Although Russia acted so quickly that she must have had prior knowledge of President Nasser's plans, his Arab allies were taken by surprise. Israel was frankly incredulous. In his resignation speech after the ceasefire, Nasser stated that Moscow had warned him that Israel was preparing to attack Syria. This may well have been true, but probably over on the scale of a heavy raid. The president, however, had assigned a defence pact with the country, and his claim to leadership compelled him to act to help his ally. If she were attacked, while, however, sending his troops into Sinai, he had declared that he, sh he would not commence hostilities. Everyone who has had any military experience in the Middle East during the last 20 years was fully aware that the Egyptian army had not the faintest chance against the Israelis. Personally, I estimated the duration of a battle in Sinai at 48 hours. In fact, I believe it occupied some 60 hours. It is to me inconceivable that the Russians ima imagined for a single moment that Egypt would win. How they persuaded Nasser to embark on such a venture is a mystery, but it is extremely significant that it was Moscow who warned him of the alleged intention of Israel to attack Syria. After the destruction of the Egyptian army in Sinai, the British press expressed jubilation at the rebuff suffered by Russia, who had backed the wrong horse. Unfortunately, the Soviet government are not quite so simple-minded as that. On the contrary, Russia may have been fully aware that the Egyptians would be disastrously defeated and wanted it that way. None of the Arab countries wish to become a Soviet satellite. They are, in some cases, willing to accept Russian subsidies, armaments or technical assistance, but only up to a point they will not go so far as to sacrifice any of their sovereignty. If Egypt had, by some wild chance, defeated Israel, her strength and prestige would have been so enhanced that she would have been less prepared than ever to be subservient to Russia. If, on the other hand, she were humiliated, she and her friends would realise that they were utterly incapable of standing up to Israel. In these circumstances, they would have no alternative but to beg for Russian help. It was, therefore, essential under the Russian plan that the Arabs should be defeated in as humiliating a fashion as possible. The British and the Americans have simple minds and accept offence unquestioningly at their face value. They assume that the Russians, having supported Egypt, must now be bitterly chagrined at the defeat of their ally. In fact, however, this kind of double-cross comes naturally to the Soviet government. I suggest that the Russian plan has two objectives. One, to cause the United States to come out irretrievably on the side of Israel, the minute she was threatened. Curiously enough, Britain, hitherto more circumspect, did the same. For the Russians, this may have been an unexpected but extremely valuable bonus. Two, to lure the Arabs into a catastrophic defeat when the United States and Britain were already completely committed to Israel. The achievement of these two objectives would convince the Arab states of their hopelessness of their struggle against Israel and of the complete commitment of Britain and America to the Israeli cause. It would then be obvious that the only hope for the Arabs was to throw themselves unreservedly into the arms of Russia. It is true that the Egyptians might resent the fact that Russians did not intervene to prevent their defeat, but however indignant they might feel on this point, they would be obliged to rely solely on Russia for their reconstruction. Everything went perfectly according to the Soviet plan. As soon as Nasser's attitude became threatening, the United States fell into the trap, closely followed by Britain. The Arab world, in a bitter resentment and disillusionment, broke off relations, cut off oil and made all retaliatory gestures they could think of. If Soviet le leaders ever laughed, this must have been the moment. Heads I win, tails you lose. But let us assume, an assumption to me quite incredible, that Russia thought Egypt might win. In this case, the United States, followed by Britain, might have intervened more strongly in favour of Israel. 
and the Arab and Muslim worlds would have been even more estranged from the West. Though they might not have been obliged to throw themselves so completely into the arms of Russia, in other words, the Soviet knew what NASA was going to do, and to say the least, did nothing to stop him. They did not care whether he won or lost, as Russia was bound to win in either case. Israel's Opportunity the Israelis, though at first incredulous that NASA could really be risking war, appear to have realised that they had been given a godsend opportunity. There is not much that Israel can get from Egypt, except perhaps the passage of her ships through the Suez Canal. The Sinai Desert, 200 miles of nearly waterless sand and rocks, divides Egypt from Israel. But ever since 1948, the Jordan border has only been 12 miles from the Mediterranean. Moreover, Jordan also held half Jerusalem including all the holy places. Jordan was a very small country and extremely poor. In the recent fighting, according to press reports, Jordan had one armoured brigade and Israel eight armoured divisions. Above all, the Jordan aircraft were few and obsolete because she had no money to buy better. The greater part of the Jordan army were destroyed by napalm, which may be described as liquid fire, discharged from the air, which burns up everything on the ground. I have before me signed statements from a team of doctors from the American University of Beirut, who volunteered to help in Jordan military hospitals. Here are some extracts. I handled 600 to 700 patients, of whom 150 were civilians. 200 were suffering from second degree burns. I did not see a single bullet wound. Many soldiers say that their units were destroyed by fire without their ever seeing an Israeli soldier. A doctor reported that the mobile field hospital containing 350 patients were, was incinerated with all its patients and staff by napalm. By and large, the Jordan armed forces were less than one twelfth of the strength of those of Israel in numbers, apart from the modernity or obsolescence of its weapons. The Jordan Dilemma The Jordan government in general was fully conscious of its vulnerability. Until 1956, Jordan relied on her treaty with Britain. Unfortunately for her, she that year terminated her treaty. Though she remained on extremely cordial terms with both Britain and the United States, both of which gave her financial assistance, Jordan was one of the few Arab states which had always rejected communist blandishments, relying entirely on the Western powers. This attitude in Jordan's independent policy, however, gave great offence to Egypt and Syria, both of which repeatedly attempted to foment rebellions in that country. The pretext given by them for these subversive activities was that Jordan was not wholehearted in her struggle against Israel, who could have easily have been defeated were it not for the treachery of Jordan. Safe behind 200 miles of the Sinai Desert, Egypt had sent saboteurs into Israel. Poor little Jordan, half surrounded by the immensely stronger Israelis, was obliged to avoid giving any provocation. It is obvious that if Egypt were to go to war with Israel, but Jordan hung back, the charge of King Hussein's collusion with Israel would have been apparently proved. If Nasser had been victorious, King Hussein could have been shot as a traitor. If Egypt had been defeated, all the blame could have been laid on the treachery of the Jordan. Jordan deserted by her friends, the United States and Britain was in a desperate position. Those today who say that King Hussein should have not supported Egypt are unaware of the impossible, even the agonising dilemma in which Jordan was placed. Ever since her repulse by the Jordan army in 1948, Israel had longed for an opportunity to overrun the remaining Arab part of Palestine. But as long as Jordan was the friend of Britain and the United States and offered her no pretext, Israel could not move. From 1948 to 1956, I was myself, under the Jordan government, responsible for the defence of the Jordan frontier of Israel. I was, of course, fully aware that Jordan could not compete with the ever-increasing build-up of the Israeli armed forces. This was especially true in the air, Jordan having no money to organise a modern air force. The unreserved support expressed by the Western powers for Israel at the commencement of the present crisis and Jordan's unavoidable expression of solidarity with Egypt, for reasons already explained, gave Israel the excuse which had been so long denied her. The destruction of Jordan was a heaven-sent windfall for Israel. It was also a nice bonus for Russia, for Jordan had for 50 years been Britain's devoted ally. To Asia, the moral would be obvious. Is Israel an imperialist fortress? The accusation endlessly made against Israel ever since the commencement of Jewish immigration after the First World War had been that she is a tool of Western imperialism. While we are being constantly told that persecuted Jews have a right to live, the Arabs believe Israel to be a purely offensive weapon. The zeal shown by the Western powers to defend Israel convinces the Arabs that their motive is not purely humanitarian, but that their own interests are vitally concerned. They believe Israel to be an Anglo-American fortress, stuffed with all the latest weapons and established in their mists as a constant armed threat to the Arab world. 
the Arabs may be completely wrong in this opinion, but it is important that we realise what they think so that we may understand their actions. Throughout the whole period since the Balfour Declaration in 1917, Britain and America have been the targets for the most virulent political attacks, having planted the enemy placed the arms in the heart of the Middle East. Hatred expressed against Israel, per se, has been far less bitter than that against the Western powers, of whom she is believed to be a mere tool. Contrary to the common belief in Britain, Jews and Arabs are not traditional enemies. On the contrary, for 13 centuries until the beginning of Zionism, Jews and Muslims were traditional allies against Christendom. Arabs have never persecuted Jews, as European nations have. It is ironical to think that the West, which did the persecution, is now inflicting retribution for these past atrocities on the people who did not only never committed them, but who for centuries provided refuge for the persecuted Jews who escaped Europe. The friendly Arab-Jewish relationship might have endured to this day if the Zionists had not decided to use force instead of brotherhood, force applied first by Britain and then by America. The strong reaction of the United States and then of Britain in support of Israel as soon as the present crisis began amply confirmed the belief that Israel was their tool, put there and maintained there by them with the object of using her to dominate the Middle East for them. British support for Zionism, at least in the early years after the First World War, did, in fact, derive considerable strength from humanitarian motives, from compassion for the persecutions suffered by Jews and from religious feeling for the chosen people. But since this support was provided by British bayonets, its humanitarian aspect was not appreciated by the people of Palestine. Many Jews indeed remembered the old traditions and wished to live in peace and friendship with the Arabs, to whom their scientific and technical knowledge could have conveyed immense benefits. But in 1948, force was so successful that the voice of Jewish humanitarianism was silenced. The Suez Affair Then came the Suez Operation in 1956, in which two Western governments acted in military cooperation with Israel against Egypt. It must be clearly understood that the maritime nations may or may not have had a case against Egypt over the Suez Canal. If they had pursued their grievance, their motive would not have been understood, but the, to conduct these operations with Israel as an ally was to confirm all the Arab suspicions that Israel was a vast Western military base for which military operations could be directed against any Middle Eastern state. The Straits of Tehran. The question of the navigation of the Straits of Tehran was a delicate one. Egypt claims territorial waters. I am not an expert in maritime law. The claim may have been unjustifiable, but it would have been better better if the Western powers had quoted chapter and verse to show that the claim was wrong. Their immediate and vociferous Israel right or wrong attitude confirmed the worst Arab suspicions that America and Britain were not great humanitarian and civilised nations, but armed bravos defending their military base. There does not in fact appear to have been any such instant hurry to open the strength of Tehran. Israel existed for several years after 1948, before developing the port of Eilat to its present dimensions. If Israel had been short of oil, it could have been sent to her from America, while the legal aspects of this dispute were under discussion. The United States is immensely powerful. While all the Middle East governments are pygmies beside her, it is difficult to believe that she can have thought that the Israelis were in danger of being pushed into the sea, when every officer who has served in the area, and every country has an American military attaché, was fully aware of the relative strengths of Israel and Egypt. Was it then not a little hasty to declare her support for Israel so early? British weakness. The British government tells us that Britain is now too weak to act effectively in the Middle East, but British interests in Asia and Africa are immense. The Dutch are somewhat similarly placed, with many associations in the East and extensive shipping interests which they peacefully pursue. If the United States is so strong and Britain so weak, why do we have to crash in with the Americans in this bull in the china shop manner? It is a useful principle when in the tight corner to keep your mouth shut. The Russians are up to endless intrigues, but they are wise enough to maintain expressionist faces and shut mouths. Soviet policy. Soviet policy today is definitely not to risk a nuclear war. Russia hopes to achieve world domination by two methods. A. By exhausting the Western powers by stirring up constant trouble for them all over the world, as in Vietnam, where she supplies weapons to the Vietnamese but will not facilitate peace talks. The Russians themselves never take part in these hostilities, whereas the Americans and British are constantly engaged in operations provoked by Russian intrigues. Not only do the Western powers exhaust themselves by these methods, but they become increasingly unpopular throughout the world. But even this is not all, for the corollary that all those countries which are in conflict with Britain and America find themselves obliged to lean on Russia. Let us get this point quite clear. Russia is trying to win over the uncommitted nations of Asia and Africa by making trouble between them and the United States and Britain. 
when a conflict or even political tension occurs, the Russians step forward to help the victims of American aggression. As is the present case in the Middle East, the Russians are quite capable of luring on an endless state to defeat, in order that she may then be able to dash forward and rescue it from Western imperialism. B. The second facet of Soviet policy, having created hostility into the West, is to foster subversive activities inside the Western nations against their own governments. They hope thereby to facilitate the task of the secret organisations, which they maintain in Western countries to foment revolution. The present crisis in the Middle East has been arranged by Russia for these purposes. She could not care less for the Arabs and for their grievances. In spite of her present indignation against Israel, she raced the United States in 1948 to recognise the new state, and in spite of the United Nations' embargo on the supply of arms to the combatants, she supplied arms to Israel, not to the Arabs, while the fighting was still going on. Subsequently, she changed sides and now hopes to stir up a conflict between the Arabs and the West, if possible between all Islam and the West. When the United States announced her support for Israel, these Russian objectives were well on their way to being achieved. Now to give my overview and thought of, of that passage. So the Soviets' goal of forcing America in particular and the West more generally to back Israel and sh- to ensure an Arab defeat, the Arabs will then turn to the Soviets for support and aid. We can see a parallel of this today with Russia, the situation being compounded with the current war in Ukraine. However, the Russians aren't the only power that has an interest. Indeed, both the Iranians and the Saudis want to stick their oar in. For the Russians, it ultimately doesn't matter if the Arabs win or lose, so long as they can drift into the arms of an anti-Western power. The recent announced BRICS expansion is testament to this. The Six-Day War gave Israel a chance to improve its geographic position by seizing territory from a weaker neighbour. Jordan had had protection from the West, hence why Israel couldn't strike earlier. Jordan was forced to side with the Arabs or become isolated as the other Middle Eastern nations did not forget her treachery when she apparently conspired with Israel to partition Palestine. The Arabs perceived Israel as an outpost of Western power, an alliance with Christianity and Judaism against Islam. You could say the Arabs feel a sense of betrayal at Jews switching their allegiance, but I think it's more complicated than that. The Jews sided with Islam because it was to their mutual benefit and have only changed their alliance partner because it suits them now that their goal is the establishment of a sovereign homeland. The Suez crisis only confirmed Arab suspicions about the purpose of Israel. America made an error by rushing to back Israel too soon, for the Arab nation saw what her true intention was. Britain has also made the mistake of backing Israel. It should also be noted that the closure of the Suez Canal by Egypt led to the British withdrawal from her last Middle Eastern territories in Aden on the 30th of November 1967, only confirming this weakness. Though Russia's power and influence is not what it was in 1967, I think the situation is not too dissimilar. The only difference being Russia is fighting for its own survival rather than world domination. Therefore, a coalition of anti-Western powers of the Russians supported by the Iranians and possibly the Saudis. Part 2. Asia and Africa. The Arab world. Russia, we have seen, engineered the present crisis. A. In order to embroil the United States with the Arab world by causing her to declare unequivocally her unilateral support for Israel, right or wrong. B. In order to lure Egypt and Syria into a humiliating defeat which would compel them to throw themselves unreservedly into the arms of Russia, Britain and the United States, having declared unequivocally, as it appeared for Israel. Britain and America fell innocently into the trap. The Arab world extends for nearly 4,000 miles, from Morocco to the head of the Persian Gulf. It occupies two out of four sides of the Mediterranean, and the whole of the Middle East corridor through which traffic passes from the Far East, Australia, India and East Africa to Europe. The Arab states are militarily weak, but the territories which they occupy are strategically the most important in the world. The danger to the Western powers is not from the military strength of the Arab states, but from the importance of the territories they hold, should they pass under Russian control. The Arab states would doubtless defend their independence against Russian domination to the best of their ability, unless fear of Israel, or of the Western powers supporting her, obliged them to throw themselves irrevocably on the mercy of the Soviets. Israel, on the other hand, has scarcely any territory at all. The whole of Palestine is only the size of Wales. Israel has no canal to the Indian Ocean and no oil fields. It is not possible to land in Israel and fly onto the east without overflying hundreds of miles of Arab territory. 
the strategic uselessness of Israel is to persons who pause to think the strongest argument against the theory that she is an Anglo-American fortress in the Middle East. An interesting corollary to the supply of the large quantities of Russian heavy equipment to Egypt and other countries is that in the event of a major emergency, Russian personnel could be flown in to man the tanks and aircraft in a few hours. Northern Iraq is only separated from Soviet territory by 150 miles. Thereafter, all the territory to be overflown from the Caucasus to Cairo would be Arab. Israel may be a giant when opposed to Jordan, but we are dwarf in the face of a Russian giant. The United States is the other side of the world. It must be clearly understood that while the hostility of the Middle East is disastrous to Britain and even to all Europe, it is of little short-term importance to the United States. America is on the opposite side of the world from Arabia. She does not have to cross the Middle East to reach India, the Far East or East Africa. Her access to the Indian Ocean is from across the Pacific. Whereas one ship in six uses the Suez Canal as British, the United States scarcely needs to use it at all. Ultimately, of course, Russian control of the Arab world would be disastrous for America, also for it would weaken her European allies, but she does not immediately feel any great inconvenience from the closing of the Middle East to her ships and aircraft. Naval command of the Mediterranean. The greatest empires in history have been the Persian, uh, that of Alexander the Great and the Greeks, the Roman, the Arab caliphs and the British. All these widely different empires have had one characteristic in common. They have held all Egypt and naval command of the Mediterranean. The Persians and Greeks only held complete command of the eastern half. The West in those days were savages. The Romans enjoyed naval command of the Mediterranean and all its shores and thereby dominated Europe for 600 years. The Arabs held Syria, Egypt, North Africa, Spain and for the first time Sicily, Malta, the Balearics and southern Italy. Arab naval command of the Mediterranean reduced Western Europe from the thriving commercial community of Roman times to feudalism, ignorance and poverty of the Dark Ages. With naval command of the Mediterranean in Muslim hands, European trade and industry withered away. Let us consider for a moment the fate of empires which failed to secure naval command of the Mediterranean. In the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire was the greatest in the world. It conquered Hungary, which then included much of the modern Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and incorporated it in, in the empire. It laid siege to Vienna and its troops crossed into Germany. It held naval command of the eastern half of the Mediterranean. In 1565, the Ottomans realised that further conquests in Europe demanded naval command of the whole Mediterranean. They accordingly laid siege to Malta, the key of the Mediterranean, but failed to take it. In 1571, their fleet was defeated at Lepanto. They had failed in their bid to gain naval command of the Mediterranean. This was the turning point of Ottoman greatness. After Lepanto, their empire fell into decline. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte was on the threshold of his career. Almost all Europe was hostile to France, but Napoleon took an army and invaded Egypt. His penetrating intellect had grasped the fact that to dominate Europe, the first essential is to hold Egypt. He had, however, made the mistake of seizing Egypt before securing naval command of the Mediterranean. The British fleet destroyed his ships at the Battle of the Nile, and Napoleon's campaign was a failure. After Waterloo, in exile at St Helena, the Emperor, surveying his whole career, said that his failure to hold the Middle East had changed his destiny. To the British Governor, Sir Hudson Lowe, he said that Egypt was the most important country in the world, and under an uninterrupted succession of brilliant military victories in Europe ended in failure because Britain held naval command of the Mediterranean. The two world wars ended in victory for the Western Allies because Britain held Egypt and naval command of the Mediterranean. In these circumstances, Germany, like Napoleon, could not win the war, no matter how great her land victories. In 1940, when Britain was threatened with invasion, Mr Winston Churchill sent reinforcements around the Cape to Egypt. He realised, like Napoleon, that ultimate victory in Europe depended on holding Egypt and the Mediterranean. With these factors in mind, the recent British moves to abandon Malta and possibly to compromise on Gibraltar seem to be precarious. It was interesting to note that when Britain reached a deadlock in her negotiations with Malta, Russia offered the island a subsidy with no strings attached. Obsessed as we are by anti-colonialism, we fear that Aden may be occupied by NASA. The real point is whether it will become a Russian naval base on the Indian Ocean. Russia and the Mediterranean For 150 years, Russia has sought to obtain a naval base on the Mediterranean. Her ambitions were directed to the seizure of Constantinople, Istanbul. She had no close allies on the Mediterranean who could place naval bases at her disposal. Today, however, the southern and eastern shores of the Mediterranean are dotted with airfields and naval bases, most of them built by Britain or France. 
Beirut, Alexandria, Bizerta in Tunisia, Oran in Algiers are just a few of many. Close cooperation between the Soviets and these Arab countries should place facilities at the disposal of Russia, of which she has been dreaming for 150 years. I do not think that these countries would be in too great haste to grant these facilities, but would inevitably transform these gradually into Russian satellites. But the persistence of one-sided Anglo-American support for Israel might well bring them to such a decision. This is undoubtedly the aim of Russian policy. A thoughtful consideration of these factors will suffice to show the puerility of the chirpings and crowings in the British press to the effect that Russia had backed the wrong horse. Hitherto, the Russian plan has met with absolutely unmixed success. Russia and Israel. It may be incidentally be noted that such an ultimate result would be ultimately fatal to Israel, who may be strong in relation to Egypt, but not in comparison to Russia. Tiny Israel, isolated at the eastern end of the Mediterranean in the Soviet Arab world, would scarcely survive for long. The Muslim world, but if Arab territory is vast and of su- supreme strategic importance, Muslim territory is immensely more so. It commences at Mauritania on the Atlantic and extends across southern Soviet territory to Mongolia. A glance at the map shows that this vast area, when joined to the Soviet Russia, completely encircles Europe, except on the west coast facing America. If Russia was to become dominant in the Arab world, Western Europe would probably be obliged to submit to Soviet rule also. These are the stakes for which Russia is playing, and let us not make any mistake about it. The Arab states would become Russian colonies, a status which they would not at all relish, but fear of conquest by Israel might lead some of them to take hasty steps which would ultimately produce that result. Of all the great powers, Britain has for a century and a half or two centuries had the closest associations with the Muslim world, France occupying the second place and Holland probably the third. Although all these Muslim countries are now independent, they are closely associated with Britain in business, finance, insurance, shipping and other activities. Great numbers of Muslim students come to England to complete their education. Without amicable relations with the Muslim world, Britain would suffer disastrously. In those bad imperial days, which we now also vigorously denounce, tens of thousands of people in Britain had lived for years in intimacy with Eastern peoples. Often the cabinet contained a member who had such experience, and Parliament almost certainly did so. The feelings, the customs and the interests of Asian peoples are well known in England. The British in the East were sometimes arrogant, but they were also benevolent. Moreover, thousands of British people were bound by personal links and love of sympathy with individual Arabs, Indian Muslims, Sikhs, Gurkhas, Malays and others. The end of empire has reduced political hostility, but it also has severed innumerable, innumerable delicate ties of mutual affection, sympathy and understanding. Our reorientation towards Europe and America has tended to cause these ties to be forgotten, though our very livelihood depends on their maintenance. Moreover, the most valuable ties were the human ones, which were in danger of severance. The Arabs will be obliged to sell their oil to us because they need the money, our financial experts say. Can friendship and cooperation be maintained on a purely cash basis? It is love, sympathy and understanding which make the world go round, and these cannot be reckoned up on a balance sheet of profit and loss. Yet our profits and losses are also our own very survival, depending on these patient qualities of mutual tolerance, understanding and love. The end of Britain's love affair with Arabia, the Observer announces, is in a special feature. Is the British press wise to slap our old friends and allies in the face? In any case, it is the press or the government who selects our allies. Few people in Britain stop to think that every word printed in the English press is known next day in the Arab capitals, where the freedom of the newspapers is not understood. How often have I heard Arabs say, when some hostile or contemptuous remark has appeared in, in an English paper, they could not write that unless their government approved. Public relations. Much of the dangerously widening gap between the Western powers and Asia and Africa is due to public relations. The Israelis have a superbly efficient system of public relations in Britain and America, together with powerful influence in the press, cinema and other forms of publicity. No Arab states has any such organisation. In the recent crisis, all the newspapers were filled with Israeli news from cover to cover. I was unable to discover any article anywhere putting forward any other viewpoints. This was not solely due to prejudice. Speaking both to newspaper men and to broadcasters, I was told that photographs, film, tape, articles and news flashes poured into their offices from Israeli sources, but not a word from Arab countries. In Asia, however, Israelis have no such organisation. In Arab countries, news is received from local agencies and from the mouths of refugees. 
Thus, the public in Britain and America on the one hand, and that's in Asia on the other, are whipped up into theory and indignation by completely contrary accounts of the events which take place. Personally, I cannot help feeling that responsible radio systems and newspapers in the United States and Britain should make strenuous efforts to present both sides. Instead of pub publishing what is given to them by the most efficient public relations organisation, Asia and Africa. The repercussions in the Middle East crisis are not limited to the Islamic world. India has expressed their support for the Arab cause. A great part of Asia shares the opinion that Israel is a fortress outpost of Western imperialism. The ruling class in Israel is European and is often not a little contemptuous of the Arabs, whom they regard as natives. The attitude abandoned 60 years ago by Britain herself still permeates the Israeli attitude. While the British government is kneeling over backwards to provide the equality of all races, the Arab-Israeli struggle tends to assume the form of the worldwide revolt of the have-nots against the haves. It may be pointed out that the prevalence of the opinion that Israel is not is an Anglo-American imperialist fortress is extremely menacing to the future of Israel herself. Every military triumph she achieves with Western support intensifies the hostility of the vast masses of Asia and of the North, perhaps all of all Africa. Arabs often say, we have no quarrel with Jews as such, if they would become Middle Easterners like us. It is their assumption of the superiority of Europeans which makes it impossible to deal with them. This tactless contempt for their neighbours, increasing with every military victory, would appear to be, in fact, very much against the long-term interest of Israel. Asians are proud and bitterly resent contempt. A quarrel which began the little country of Palestine has now spread to the Arab world, and to a less extent to the Muslim world, it may soon spread to wider and wider areas of Asia and Africa, and come to be regarded as a test case in the struggle between the West and Afro-Asian peoples. Unfortunately, such is human nature, acts of kindness and humanity are soon forgotten, but insults and injuries are nursed from generation to generation. The fact that the United States is feeding the people of the famine areas of India is soon forgotten. A saber rattling in defence of Israel will be remembered for decades. The British and American press were surprised at the enthusiastic demonstrations in support of President Nasser after his defeat. Where were all the psychologists, I wonder? If Nasser had won, many others would have looked on him with jealousy. After his defeat, however, he became a martyr to Western imperialism. We do not know how long this will last, but martyrs are awkward people. It is not intended to suggest that the Muslim world is liable at any moment to ally herself with Russia. Communist atheism is an obstacle. There are 20 million Muslims in Soviet territory, and the Communist Party has never made any secret of its contempt for and hostility to the Muslim religion. Nevertheless, the Muslim world has long been our friend and is closely associated with us. A rupture between Muslims and ourselves would be a disastrous for both. But every Muslim in the world has been against us during this Middle East crisis. The United States has no such long-term associations with Muslims, who, as already indicated, are on the opposite side of the world to it. Nor would the hostility of the Muslim world be so immediately harmful to America as to us. Britain is allied to America in NATO and perhaps has a special relationship with her, but this does not compel us to repeat every statement issued by her, especially on matters which, owing to the facts of history and geography, affect us in a manner quite different to their impact on the United States. So much for the repercussions of this struggle on the outside world and its possibly disastrous effects on Britain herself. It is, however, a mistake to attribute the enmity we have incurred solely to Russian intrigue or to the virulence of Cairo radio. If justice were entirely on the side of Israel, we would need to fear no qualms. But if the Arabs of Palestine have a genuine grievance, then its exploitation by Russia, by Egypt or by other enemies may indeed be extremely dangerous. Justice and honesty are the best policy. Many books have been written on the subject, but we may attempt to give a few aspects of this vexed problem. That's the end of part two, and to just give my thoughts on that segment uh, titled Asia and Africa. Arab world is militarily weak, but strategically important as a land bridge between Europe, Africa and Asia. Russian domination of the region would be a disaster for Israel and the West. The war in Ukraine has tied up significant Russian forces for the moment, but once that conflict has been wrapped up, Russia will be more than likely looked to the Middle East. Perhaps she will help her ally Syria put an end to the latter's interminable civil war. Iran has a proxy Hezbollah in parts of Lebanon, through which to cause travel for Israel. The United States can better endure being shut out of the Middle East due to her geography. However, her European vassal states would suffer from the disruption of trade through the Suez Canal were Egypt to shut it off again like it did in 1967. An independent Egypt is a threat 
to the Western command of the Mediterranean. However, the British still possess naval bases in Gibraltar and Cyprus, and many other countries have that have access to the Mediterranean are NATO allies. However, not all NATO members are fully keen on Israel, as we have seen with Turkey, who critically controls the Bosporus Straits, blocking Russian access to the Mediterranean. Even with its enemies denied naval access, Israel would be in a precarious military situation if arrayed against a coalition of hostile powers. Though she would humble her enemies in 1967, we mustn't forget that she did not fare so well in the Yom Kippur War of 1973, in which this year is the 50th anniversary of. Israeli hubris could be very well her downfall. The Western powers were once again, upon a time, much more balanced in their diplomacy. The British especially always changed the whole that they were backing to suit their interests. Pity she seems unable to pull away from supporting the Israelis. However, it appears the Israeli presentation of themselves as the underdogs is not as effective as it once was. Many are beginning to turn away from them. And indeed, it seems even is- Israel's once further font of support in the West is showing signs of faltering, only really maintaining any degree of sympathy from the centre-right party, such as the British Conservatives or the American Republicans. Part 3. A Brief History of the Palestine Grievance A million natives of Palestine in 1948 were driven from their homes and 19 years later, most of them are still in refugee camps. Regardless of the rights and wrongs of the state of affairs, the point I wish to make is that these people were convinced that they had a grievance. Now, if a man has a grievance, his resentment can often be lessened or even removed if he is given the chance to state his case before an impartial tribunal. If, however, he believes that he cannot obtain a just hearing, he becomes obstreporous. If, when this happens, he is cracked on the head with a pickaxe, he may well develop an incurable persecution complex. The Balfour Declaration I do not propose to discuss the early stages of Zionism in Palestine, but British people may like to be reminded of the first two pledges contained in the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Firstly, His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate this object. Such was the promise made to the Jews. The second part of the declaration contained a promise to the Arabs of Palestine. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done without may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. The Jews who were in Palestine in 1917 were living peaceably with the Arabs. They represented 7% of the population, the Arabs providing 93%. Before 1914, when a Palestinian Arab wanted particularly to emphasise the truth of a statement he was making, he would add, word of an Englishman, what I say is true. Prior to the First World War, an Englishman's word was believed to be his bond. The phrase quoted is now no longer used by Palestinians. The Allied Pledges. During the First World War, the Balfour Declaration was not the only pledge given. Britain, France and the United States promised that all the peoples previously governed by the Turks should have the right to choose their own form of government. This pledge was also one of Woodrow President Wilson's 14 points, which aroused intense enthusiasm all over the world for their noble ideas of the people of the United States. The people to whom these promises were made ultimately obtained their fulfilment. The people of Palestine alone were an exception. They were never allowed to choose their own government. Intervention of other Arab states. After the Second World War, the Arabs of Palestine, realising their own weakness and unable to present their own case, not being a sovereign state, called upon other Arab states for help. I frankly do not know the legal precedents, if any exist, for one independent state representing an entirely different country. Suffice it to say that the Arab states who represented the Arabs of Palestine before the United Nations were not a party party to the dispute, and in some cases, at least, knew little or nothing about it. In any case, at the vital session at which the partition of Palestine was eventually accepted, the Arab states decided to boycott the proceedings. As a result, the Arab-Palestine case was never put to the assembly. Fighting broke out immediately after the end of the British mandate in May 1948. Israel gained a sweeping military victory and was allowed to enjoy the fruits of her armed success, thus the rights and wrongs of the case were never stated by the Palestinians. Armed force was means used for settlements. The justification usually urged for the procedure was that Egyptians were the aggressors because they invaded the area allotted to Israel by the United Nations. The argument is of somewhat doubtful validity. Firstly, the omission of hundreds of thousands of Jewish immigrants into Palestine under the protection of British army during the mandatory period against the bitter opposition of the 93% 
of the people of the country is rightly or wrongly regarded by the Palestinians as military aggression. Secondly, it may be questioned whether the United States had the legal power to order that half the territory of the country be taken from the inhabitants or given to a completely foreign race of immigrants. Further, as we shall see below, the Egyptians are an entirely different race from the Palestinians. If let us assume the Egyptians commit a breach of international law, there is no apparent reason why the Palestinians should be driven from their homes. It is not my object to say that these arguments or any others are valid or not. The point which I, make, I wish to make is that Palestinians genuinely believed that they had a grievance which they felt and had never received an impartial hearing. What is an Arab? The justification for the, the Israeli seizure in 1948 of considerably more territory than was allotted to them by the United Nations was therefore that the Egyptians were the aggressors and so the Arabs got what they deserved. The, the Jordanians did not enter territory allotted by the UNO to Israel but defended this area allotted to the Arabs. Firstly, it must be realised that the Arabs, as a word is used today, are not a single race, but a cultural group of entirely different races. It is not a political opinion, but a scientific fact, which anthropologists can prove by such means. As shul sh skull shapes, physical measurements, hair, eyes, blood tests, and so on. The Arab world may be compared to the Latin American world, which forms a linguistic and cultural group often acting in unison. Nobody would agree to an American annexation in Nicaragua, on the grounds of the hostility of Cuba. Why not? They're all Latin Americans, aren't they? The relationship of Egypt to Palestine may be compared to that of Germany or Holland to Britain, if the North Sea were full of sand instead of water. Racially, the Germans, Dutch and British may probably be about as closely related as the Egyptians to the Palestinians. But they all speak Arabic, don't they? Yes, though with considerable variations. But the Latin Americans speak Spanish, but they are different nations. West Indians and the coloured people in the United States speak English as their mother tongue, that can scarcely be said to be English. Many of the linguistic affinities were, are due to military conquest centuries ago, and do not signify any racial relationship. Let us therefore appreciate that Egypt is an independent state separated from Palestine by 200 miles of sand, and having virtually no racial affinity with the Palestinians, it is therefore, on the face of it, not just to drive the Palestinians from their homes, using the behaviour of the Egyptians as a pretext. It is true that the Palestinians, weak and helpless, as they felt themselves to be in the face of the powers opposed to them, claim to be of the same race as the other Arabic-speaking peoples. Their claims, however, do not alter the physical facts. Moreover, in actual practice, the intervention of the other Arab states did them more harm than good. The Palestine refugees. In 1948, about a million Palestinians were driven from their homes by force. It may have been alleged that some or all of them left their homes voluntarily on the instructions of their leaders. No one has ever said what leader gave this order, on what occasion or by what means. Personally, I do not believe that this order was ever given and I am not an international liar. However, I am prepared for the sake of argument to assume that these statements were correct. Let us assume that the people of Palestine left their homes on orders from their leaders, who told them that they would be subsequently be able to return. Their leaders, incidentally, were self-appointed to return. The politicians not elected or representative. In fleeing from their homes, they abandoned their shops, their houses, their businesses, their farms and their livelihoods. In 1940, great numbers of French people left their homes for the advancing German armies and fled in the clothes they stood up in. Nobody's ever suggested that they nearby fortified their right to return to their homes when the war was over. The million-odd Palestinians who fled in 1948 had never been allowed to return. Most of them are still living in sordid camps where they have been for 19 years. It is quite essential, vividly, to grasp the unique conditions of the struggle in Palestine. We have witnessed many wars in this century, in which one country seeks to impose its power on others, but no war, I think, for many centuries past has the objective been to remove a nation from its country and to introduce another and entirely different race to occupy its lands, houses and cities and live there. This peculiarity leads to the Palestinian struggle, a desperate quality which bears no resemblance to any other war in modern history. Why don't the Arab, other Arab countries take them? When the pitiful state of the Palestinian refugees is mentioned, this question is often asked. Perhaps the Palestinians or the Arabs as a whole have laid themselves open to this rebuke by claiming to be all of one homogenous race. We have already seen that the Arabs, as the expression is used today, are a cultural and linguistic group of many different racial origins. What would be said if the United States sees Cuba? and evicted all the Cubans from their homes, introducing an equal number of American immigrants to replace them. They could be reabsorbed in Venezuela, couldn't they? After all, they're all Latin Americans. Well, let's take an example 
near a home. Suppose Hitler had won the Second World War and conquered Britain and decided to move all the Jews from Germany to England. For this purpose, he took over the counties of Kent, Surrey and Sussex and ordered the area to be cleared of its inhabitants to accommodate the immigrants. The persons evicted were told that they could find new homes for themselves in other parts of England. It was pointed out to him, however, that they were already unemployment in other parts of England. Well, why cannot Canada and Australia take them? They are British too, aren't they? Can we honestly say in this 20th century that human beings should be driven against their will from one country to another like human cattle? But this is how Hitler treated the Jews, many of whom have now at last found a home in Israel. This is true, but the Arabs have never persecuted Jews. There does not, therefore, seem to be any justification why the terrible sufferings of Jews in Europe should be atoned for by the infliction of similar tortures on the people of Palestine. The question of our Arab countries taking refugees is many facets, too various to enumerate here. It may, however, be pointed out that half the refugees were in Jordan, which not only accepted them but gave them full Jordanian citizenship. Secondly, the refugees did not want to leave their country. In that part of Palestine, which has been in Jordan since 1948, the refugees felt themselves still in their, ho- uh, their own country and within a few miles of their old homes. The well-educated refugees did indeed find employment in other countries, some of them in Saudi Arabia. Many of the others could not have been made to leave what they considered to be their native country. Sometimes it has even been said that the miseries of the refugees are not Israel's fault, but that of the Arab, Arab, Arab countries which did not accommodate them. If the landlord were to evict the tenants from a house and leave them shivering in the gutter, the court of law would scarcely accept the plea that the fault lay with the neighbours who should have taken them in, not with the landlord who turned them out. The case of the Palestine Arabs, however, was far stronger for they were the owners of the houses from which they should have been evicted. Sorry, for which they had have been evicted. Moreover, Jordan accepted half the total number of refugees without hesitation and gave them Jordan citizenship. But the economy of Jordan was not capable of of absorbing them, and no financial aid was given to her to enable her to do so, except by Britain and the United States, the alleged villains of the peace. The United Nations supplied only subsistence, rations and medical care. The refugees admitted and welcomed by Jordan amounted to one third of the population of the country. The influx of refugees was equivalent to the arrival of 17 million destitute people in Britain, or 80 million in the United States. Their presence has constituted a major social and economic threat to the continued existence of Jordan ever since. In these circumstances, it can scarcely be claimed that the continued existence of refugees is the fault of the Arabs and not of Israel. A minority in Israel. In the course of the present crisis, the Israeli army has occupied all Palestine down to Jordan. In so doing, they have overtaken most of the refugees who left their homes in 1948 and who have been living there for 19 years in the Gaza Strip or in the Jordan part of Palestine, there are also a million other Palestinians who are still living in their own homes in the Arab part of Palestine, which has now been occupied by the Israeli army. It would, therefore, appear to must now be a million and a half, or a million and three quarters Palestine. Arabs in the territory controlled by the Israeli army. The number of Israelis in Israel is two and a half million. What is to become of a million and a half or more Palestine Arabs whose ancestors have been living in their homes in the country for centuries, perhaps millennia? Can they be punished, pushed out into neighbouring countries to live for another 20 years in refugee camps on United Nations bare subsistence rations? The alternative alternative suggested is that they remain as a minority in Israel, perhaps even with a local semi-autonomy in certain areas. The Israelis, it is alleged, are a democratic community. The Arabs could would receive the right to vote and would become happy Israeli citizens. Is this a possible solution? A glance at the world of today is sufficient to prove that some of the world's most intractable problems are caused by mixed races living in one country. The coloured population in the United States, the Turks and the Greeks in Cyprus, the British in Rhodesia and the Indians and Pakistanis in Kashmir are a few examples. If none of these cases where there's two races at bitter enmity, yet their inclusion in one state leads to endless problems, often giving rise to international complications. The Palestine problem is is immensely worse. The Israelis and the Arabs are divided by their intense hatred. The neighbours of Palestine have all been involved in the struggle. It is perfectly obvious that so large a minority, one and a half millions out of a total of four millions, would be looked upon by the Israelis as a dangerous security risk. They would certainly be closely watched, disarmed, controlled and suppressed, a hated and despised subject race. But are not all of our modern idealisms directed precisely at the preventing the subjugation of one race to another? 
How could the British government object so strongly to white rule in Rhodesia, and yet connive at Israeli rule over more than a million and a half Arabs in Palestine? When two races are inflamed with such bitter hatred against one another, is it possible to place a million and a half of one such race under the rule of another? The right of conquest. Until modern times, all nations recognised the right of conquest. A victorious nation had the right to annex the territory of another and reduce the inhabitants to the status of a subject race. But this very problem is what most of our idealisms are about. Jews, it is said, are good citizens, capable businessmen, civilised, cultured, charming, artistic, wonderful musicians. Much of this is true, or at least West European Jews. But surely the objection to the rule of one race by another is not that the rulers are unpleasant people, but merely that they are a different race. For centuries the English ruled Ireland, but eventually they abandoned the attempt and gave independence to the Irish. Yet some English people are quite nice, civilised citizens, but the point was that, nice or nasty, the Irish did not want to be ruled by them, and so it was recognised that British rule ought to not be imposed on them. The efficiency argument, but the Israelis are enterprising and efficient, they would develop the Arab areas and the Arabs themselves would have a higher standard of living. The same arguments were used in 1936 when Italy invaded Abyssinia. The country was poor and backward, the Italians would develop it, establish industries and make good roads, the Abyssinians themselves would be the chief beneficiaries, but the world at large rejected these arguments with vehemence. Jews also have a right to, to live. Of course they have, the same right as Christians, Muslims and Hindus. The wildness of Egyptian and Syrian demagoguery, their neglect of facts and their empty threats have done, the Palestinians more harm than good. Silly boasts about pushing Israel into the sea have been the best Israeli propaganda. Once again, however, we must remember that the Arabs are a linguistic and cultural group of many different races. It is unjust to reduce the Palestinians to subjection or to drive them from their homes because the Egyptians are carried away by their own verbosity. In any case, Israel has amply proved that she is in no danger of being pushed into the sea. She is more likely to push the Arabs into the sea or the desert. Anyone with any knowledge of the area has known this for at least 19 years. The Crusade precedent. I am no lawyer and have merely surveyed something of the problem from the Balfour Declaration until now, in order to explain to some extent how the Arabs of Palestine think. If they have a persecution complex, there are reasons for their mental state. Whether their treatment was or was not unjust, these things have happened and we cannot put the clock back. However, the fact that Israel is today supreme does not mean that she always will be. The Crusaders in the 12th century held three or four times as many territory as the Israelis hold. For 45 years, they defeated all comers. Israel has only been in existence for 19 years. The Crusaders, however, depended for their existence on the support of the West, as Israel now depends on the USA. After 80 years, the West tired of contributing and and the Crusaders suffered a disastrous defeat. But the West again returned to their help, and the states were re-established for a further century. After 190 years, they were exterminated. Throughout the whole world, 190 years, the Middle East was torn by continual wars. Dictation or negotiation. Peace can be made by dictation or negotiation. Israel may now want but peace, but she wishes to dictate it. This is human nature. Victory is heady wine. We made the same mistake in 1918 and had to fight again in, in 20 years. Voices are already to be heard. We great powers cannot settle this. It is best for the Middle East nations to settle their own affairs. When Egypt announced her control of the Straits of Tehran, the United States and Britain did not adopt this attitude of philosophic detachment. A few points on peace. To discuss the terms of peace would be too long and only a few points can be mentioned. One, everyone in the area needs security, which would be free them from the crippling burden of armaments. Security, it seems to me, can only be secured by a guarantee of all frontiers given by the great powers. If the United States, Britain, France and Russia were to join, the solution would be to complete, but we must remember that Russian policy seems to be to embroil the Western powers with the Arab world. If the great powers could impose a solution, I submit that Egypt, Syria and other states should not act for the Palestinians. Their intervention has done the latter much more harm than good. 3. A binational state of Israelis and Arabs cannot succeed. Therefore, Israel must give back that part of Palestine which formerly was united to Jordan for the Arabs to live in. Money should be provided for from outside so to develop a reconstituted Jordan that all the refugees could be settled there. They cannot be driven away like human cattle to Syria, Iraq or other countries. 
for in 1948 the united nations made a resolution that jerusalem should be international but it was never implemented i believe that the old city in bethlehem with a small area of countryside should be internationalized but not the israeli city old jerusalem is sacred to christians and muslims as well as jews its retention by israel would greatly aggravate the resentment already felt against her throughout the muslim world background summary Having discussed some of the local details of the problem, let us not forget the world background on which the very life of Britain may depend. A. The Soviet camp stands opposed to the Western powers, but the vast majority of the human race is neutral. Russia will not provoke a nuclear war, but she hopes to conquer the world by winning the uncommitted nations to her side. Her method of achieving this object is to embroil these countries against the USA. The Middle East crisis is a case in point. It is a Russian bid to win the Arab states and even the Muslim world to her side. The Arab states are not important for their size or strength, but because they command the most important strategic areas in the world. If they became Russian satellites, Europe would be ruined, but the Arabs also would lose their independence. Control of the Middle East and naval command of the Mediterranean are the instruments needed for the domination of Europe. This is the prize for which Russia is playing. D. The dangerous thing about the Palestine grievance is that they have a case for which they have never been able to state. The voice of the Palestinians has been drowned by propaganda or their defence conducted by other Arab states with their axes to grind, or they have been driven out by military action. I have not written propaganda, to the best of my ability, I have only written only the absolute and unvarnished truth. Word of an Englishman, what I say is true. And to give my final uh, thoughts on that last section titled A Brief History of the Palestine Grievance, the Palestinians do indeed appear to have developed a persecution complex. However, this, unstand this is understandable considering events. It has become apparent that the two promises of the Balfour Declaration were mutually incompatible, especially after the demographics of Palestine were permanently shifted due to large waves of Jewish immigration. The reason for Israel's astounding success vis-a-vis -vis Palestine is down to the former former superior organisation, and to use an expression of Ibn Haldun, a stronger asabaya, or the or in English, group feeling and social cohesion. As stated by Getana Mosca, the organised minority will always defeat the disorganised majority. The situation is such that any aggression by Palestine against Israel or vice versa invites intervention from other Arab states and even powers outside the area, such as the United States or Iran. To further complicate the matter, the Israelis have their own persecution complex as they conflate a Palestinian with a Jordanian or an Egyptian. Therefore, any attack by an Arab state is part of some anti-Israeli conspiracy. It doesn't consider that all the Arab states have their own identities and interests that don't, sim that don't necessarily align. This supposed sameness among the Arabs is the chief reason that Zionists argue that Palestinians shall be driven out and can simply be relocated amongst the Arab states. People who argue this know that Palestine is the home of the Palestinians and not Jordan, not Egypt, not Europe, whose politicians seem so eager against the interest of their own citizens to want to take in these refugees. The population of, Pal of the Palestinians in 2023 is estimated at nearly five and a half million. This is dramatically higher than the 1.75 million Palestinians, Palestinians in 1967. So there will be only a calamitous exodus if Israel decides to expel them. Perhaps, though, if things seem tense right now, they will calm down eventually, and there will be no displacement or genocide. Will it be, as T.S. Eliot stipulated, it won't end with a bang, but with a whimper? Thank you, um, everyone, um, for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them now. Otherwise, I'll end the stream. Uh, there has been one super chat, uh, Darth Kilhoon for two dollars. Uh, we'll watch later when I have time. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much, and Darth Kilhoon. Okay, as there appear to be uh, no questions, I will end the stream now. Um, please, if anyone does have a question, please post it in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer it. So thank you all for, for listening and good night.